Whereabouts, whereabouts are you? Well, I'm in Wisconsin. Before we even get started, tell me, give me, give me a sense of who, who is Bill Hibbert? How do you define yourself? What, uh, and yeah, give me a sense. Well, I've always been interested in math and computers. So I was first interested in artificial intelligence and computers when I was a kid. And, uh, you know, so I took a course on AI uh, in my senior year in college, 1969. <clears throat> and um, then I didn't, I didn't make my career artificial intelligence, though. I made my career just doing things with computers, mostly visualization. <clears throat> Pardon me. So, and, uh, but in 1980, I, just for a lark, I wrote an AI program, a program to play uh, the board game Othello, sometimes called Reversi. And it was a, a learning program. It was sort of patterned after a checkers program written by Arthur Samuels in 1960. So I wrote one in 1980. And it taught me the power of machine learning. And uh, I kept doing what I was doing with visualization. And then about in the year 2000, uh, as I was getting close to retiring, I retired in 2004. I got really much more interested in artificial intelligence and started writing papers about it. Actually, I started out by writing a book called Super Intelligent Machines. Not a terribly good book. It was more of a learning experience. And then I started writing papers and going to the artificial general intelligence meetings. Uh, I was at a meeting in the first one, the first AGI meeting in uh, 2008, where I presented a paper with the title Open Source AI. And uh, that really argued for transparency in AI. I argued that we really need to see the source code for AI to be able to trust it. And uh, then I just kept writing those papers in 2012. I had some good papers some papers that were widely cited and got me some attention. Uh, and then I think I wrote my last paper in 2015 uh, because I'm getting old, you know, I'm 72 now and writing technical papers, mathematical papers gets progressively difficult as you get older. Because one's cognitive function declines? Yeah, it's mostly about short-term memory. So to do mathematics, you need to have a very strong short-term memory because you have to keep a lot of mathematics in your head. Or if you're trying to prove something or do some other difficult mathematics, you have to have it all in your head. It's not good enough to just put it down on paper. And keeping it in my head became very hard. So, <laughs> so we're going to solve that. There's going to be an app for that soon. Um, <laughs> so tell me about why the why, what, what is it about math particularly, but then particularly about the idea of artificial, well, even the term intelligence, well, what does that mean? What is, you know, and then this idea of the artificiality of intelligence, well, let's define our terms. I mean, that's always a good place to start, I think. Yes, uh, well, the, the basic algorithm of intelligence, and this applies to animals, to people, and to AI, is that a system learns a model of the environment by interacting with the environment. In other words, you have an agent, which is a, a me or a computer or a dog or something. The agent <laughs> interacts with the environment and therefore learns a model of the environment. And in some cases that model might be um, predefined. So for instance, in my program for playing Othello, it pretty much had a, a predefined model of the world and the world was just the Othello board. But in human, you know, we deal with all kinds of environments. We learn that environment by interacting with it. And then we use our model of the environment to predict the outcomes from possible, possible actions, you know, things we may do. And then we choose the action that produces the desired outcome. So that's pretty much, well, that's pretty well, much funny. what intelligence it, is. So, you know, these things, desired outcomes, I mean, are... I guess all sociology, we look at an environment, we learn from the environment, or at least this other entity does and chooses, chooses things based on the, desire, the, the desired outcome. The key is the desired outcome, right? I mean, yes. in terms, so, so tell me, well, tell me about that, but in relation to as a kid, because it sounds to me like some of this was propelled from your, 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 your childlike curiosity or, or one's childlike curiosity, but. Yes, yes, uh, well, actually, just as an aside, the people I know, I know a lot of people involved in science and technology, 
And the people that do the best and are the happiest are the people that got interested in it when they were kids. People have been doing yeah. it since they were kids. And, and I was just fascinated by computers and the possibility of, it came a little later, I would say I was in my teens by the time I thought about computers being smart, well, the way people are probably not something most eight-year-olds think about. And uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's fascinating. You know, you talked about motivation. I mean, that's the key is any, you know, any intelligent system is going to have preferred outcomes. And that's its motive. That's its motivation. And so the motivation is really the key to the safety. And, you know, that's the real issue with artificial intelligence is what are, how, what are its motives? And that's a very mathematical thing. And I was fortunate to still have enough mathematical ability left in 2012 when I was 64 years old to, uh, to, to write a couple of useful papers on the subject of AI motivation from a mathematical point of view. And so there's, there's a whole lot of people out there. There's a whole community of people doing that kind of work now. It goes on. It's, it's really deep and difficult work. <laughs> So tell me about that. I mean, we're imbibing, I mean, th th there's a school of thought, I guess, that says, listen, we want to obviously learn as much about our brain and about the processes that, that take place in order for us to either mimic or better the process in, this, in, in, in an artificial way. Is that, so, is, is that what you subscribe to? Or, well, tell me about that, this sort of, understanding the brain and consciousness sure. etc <laughs> yeah that's very important so if you think about it deep learning which has revolutionized ai in the last 10 or 20 years is really inspired by our understanding of how the brain works so deep learning creates these artificial networks of neurons and uses uh, a sort of back propagation algorithm that's somewhat inspired by how brains work and uh, so uh, there's three things that really go into the development of artificial intelligence. And, and one of them is being inspired by how human brains work. You know, neuroscience understanding tells us how it works. Another component that goes into it is mathematics. So once we see how the brain works, then we need to get a mathematical handle on it. That's the way all science goes. Science, you know, mathematics is sort of the language for precisely understanding nature, including our own brains. And so there's whole mathematical theories of intelligence and how AI should work and all that stuff. And then the third component is experimentation. So people build these deep neural networks, they try to understand them mathematically, and then they turn them on and see if they work. You know, can we beat the world's best Go player or something like that, you know? And so those three components, and Understanding the human brain is, is, is a very important part. It's one of three very important parts of the pursuit of AI. So is this sort of work, as they're creating these neural networks, is this done w in conjunction with neuroscientists? Or is uh, yeah, you, for instance, I, go, I was, for a number of years, was going to the artificial general intelligence meetings, and there was, there were always invited neuroscientists. There was always sessions for the neuroscientists to come and speak, there was always a keynote speaker who was a neuroscientist who was telling us things about, uh, I think Stephen Grossman was a speaker one in, in New York City. That was very interesting. But there, there's been a lot of different neuroscientists come and, and speak to that. And it's, it's an important part. There's some interesting research. I can't, I can't remember the details because it's been a while since I've seen it, where people look at uh, artificial intelligence algorithms. Specifically, I think they're reinforcement learning algorithms, temporal difference algorithm. And then they look at in the brain and they can see signals in the brain that are fairly clearly part of the brain's own implementation of that well-known AI algorithm. So here's huh. an artificial algorithm and then they look in the brain and they can say, yes, the brain is doing that. That's wild. Isn't so we, that can wild? See that, we can see that today uh, yeah, that's uh, that that was done a number of years ago. And when we in the seeing of that, we're seeing the 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 chemical that basically the the information traveling 
on the connectomes in the same way? Is that how, how do, how do you actually visualize that? The, 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 they're seeing neurons firing. So neurons fire, you know, they sort of go yeah. bang. And uh, they're watching the firing of neurons relative to other neurons and relative to the, the external stimuli coming into the brain. And they're saying, yeah, this, if, the, if it's doing this algorithm, these things should be firing in this way, you know, and they. Oh, so it's replicating this algorithm that did it by itself. Is that, right. is that? Yeah. So oh. there's an algorithm that somebody wrote for a computer and then they can see from the way the neurons are firing, they can say, oh yeah, the neurons are, must be doing that. So is the implication, and again, I know this isn't necessarily your field, but I, I imagine as a curious person, you've thought about it. Yeah. I mean, are you of the mind, forgive or don't forgive the pun, yeah. um, that we are, I mean, that this is a series, that who and what we are, our consciousness is a series of basically mathematical processes, not dissimilar from that, those of a machine. Absolutely, absolutely. There are so many correlations between what's happening in uh, our physical brains and what we observe in our behavior, that it's, it's really clear, it's really obvious that our brains, our physical brains are creating our behavior. And, uh, you know, we don't know how, we don't know, we don't understand all the details of that. We're far from understanding all the details from that, but there's so many correlations. It would be a ridiculous coincidence if the physical brain didn't explain our minds, you know. And so, and so when, you, when you first realized that, I mean, what are the implications for you personally? And then what do you think the implications are for addressing the challenges that humanity faces? So it's a two-pronged question, really. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't, well I've, I've sort of assumed that for a long time. You know, that, that physical, I just, even as a kid, I probably, well, maybe as a teenager, I pretty much just assumed that, and I was brought up in the Episcopal religion, but it pretty much puberty was when I parted company <laughs> with the Episcopal religion. Just about the time I was being confirmed in my faith, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens. One confirmation leads to a, a complete um, explosion, I guess. Right. But, I, but I mean, is that, is it, I mean, because there's a lot of people that are really daunted by that or, or feel like we are, I mean, I mean, on the one hand, this idea that we are all these different chemical reactions governed by these mathematical principles, on the one hand, it should free us. And on, on the other hand, it makes us feel, you know, not in, you know, lacking our own free will. And there's certainly a, 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 ma a mathematical model that says there is no free will. So tell me, I mean, not to well, get too much in the philosophical weeds. But, well, okay. Well, I mean, for me, free will is a simple matter. You see individuals who are able to break free from the traditions of their families and their cultures. And to me, that's a good practical substitute for free will. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's practical. Yeah. So as we learn, I mean, so as I think you point out in some of in, in these papers, I mean, the implications as we get further understanding, whether that's through these models and through the work that, that neuroscientists are doing in, in connectonomics and, and these sorts of fields, um, does that um, make you, f d d there are all sorts of dangers that you've, you've pointed to do you want to mm -hmm. talk about some of the dangers? I mean, so, I mean, the one that sort of comes to mind because we're living in this very sort of fractured time is th this idea of propaganda and propagandizing information. And the more we can sort of, anyway, maybe you speak to that because I know you've written a bit about that. Yes, yes. To me, well, AI, I gave a talk uh, a little less than two years ago and the title of my talk was How Not to Think About Artificial Intelligence. Talk is online. So um, the idea there is that human brains, we shouldn't think about AI as being like a human brain. It's different. And one of the key ways that it's different is, I mean, I'm looking at you and I can see that you have two eyes and two ear ears and one voice as, as I do. But the computer an a can have billions of eyes, billions of ears, billions of voices. 
we have these big servers, these big AI servers. You know, we, we know who they are. I mean, they're the huge internet companies and governments and so on. And they connect via the internet to cameras and phones and all sorts of devices with which they can sense what's going on with you know billion people. And so I can't directly interact with a billion people, but an AI can. And that makes it very much different from me. So even though the AIs, the current AIs, lack many of the skills that I have, they have skills that I can't even come close to, which is the ability to know all about a billion people. And so if you look at what's happening, especially in China, there's this, they are really gung-ho for this. They are very gung-ho for AI. And they want to keep, you know, they keep Google and Facebook out because they see AI as a way to control populations, a way to surveil populations. And they do not want AIs in the United States surveilling and controlling the Chinese population. They want the AI in China to be surveilling and controlling the Chinese population, <laughs> an AI that they control. Uh, you know, when we think about politics, we often think, a lot of people think, well, you know, if only everyone like thought like I did, then the world would be all right. If, if only I could convince everyone to think the way I think, the world would be great. Well, China is doing it. And the, and, but it's, it can be only one person. So President Xi has this, has this AI and the internet, it's connected to everyone in, in China and they're, they're, the Chinese people are more embedded in the internet than we are. And he's using, he's trying to use the AI and the internet to make everyone think the way President Xi thinks. So they're cracking down on religion because President Xi doesn't, he doesn't think as a Muslim, he doesn't think as a Christian, he doesn't think as a Buddhist. He may have a sort of a, they're, they're promoting a kind of a state religion as a, so that people that want to be religious can subscribe to the state religion. And uh, they're, they're, they're surveilling the population and they're there, I mean, it's, 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 it's early days with control so that they have these, this course of system called, what's it called, uh, cre social credit score. They're trying to use to control the population. And that, it's pretty early days. AI isn't really advanced enough. Uh, you know, it isn't nearly where it's going to be in terms of its ability to persuade people. So they're, they're still relying it to some extent on coercion. I mean, in a way, what President Xi is doing is much better than the coercion of Mao. You know, Mao yeah, relied on come... murdering millions of people to get him to do what he wanted him to do. And Xi is, is probably only murdering thousands, so, you know, much better. Well, I mean, tens of thousands of Uyghurs, for sure. Of, I mean, yes, apparently. Right. Yes, right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is the evil that men do under the guise of whatever i mean so obviously look and I, I i mean you point to this but so does so much science fiction i mean these are tools and we can use these tools humanely whatever humane means to me yeah. or you i mean I, I guess what you're saying is that I, I i always remember this when i spoke to i remember one of the first times i met dean came in he said we get what we celebrate both personally and as a culture uh -huh. and so if we celebrate you know just being sheep or just working for the state, then that's what we'll get. Or it, how much of, do you, do you agree with this, I, the idea of, you know, whether it's AI or, or many of the other things that we've, we've have come into being um, as tools for our own either demise or um, something much more exciting than that? Yes, I mean, the technology, it's not only AI, it's biotechnology also. I mean, tools can be used for good or bad. And the more powerful a tool, the more, the better, the, 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 the greater the range of possibility for good and bad, you know? And so uh, I thought about this stuff for, and it, it's, it's, it's unavoidable. People say, well, we shouldn't do AI. Well, we're gonna do AI. There's no way to stop it, you know? And people say, well, we shouldn't use it to, 
surveil and control populations. Well, we're going to use it to surveil and control populations, you know, because everyone can come up with a good reason, you know, if only people would think the way I think the world would be a better place. I mean, it's a very powerful motive to use AI to persuade people. And uh, I mean, even our media, even our ordinary media, you know, not, you know, not just not AI, but just TV and so on, you know, uh, what, any information source includes persuasion, you know. I mean, I was born in 1948, ABC, NBC, and CBS all started in that year, and they're in the advertising business. I mean, they're a, yeah. they're a disseminator of information, but they're in the persuasion business. Google and Facebook are in the persuasion business. They're in the advertising business. So persuasion is sort of built into, into information. So, so what are the guardrails? What are the protections? Do we need like a, a codification of our own, yeah. you know, principles? Do we, what, what, we need openness. You know, one of the things that's going on with AI right now is there's all these AI ethics principles being disseminated. There's a wonderful book on AI written by um, Stuart Russell. It's called Human Compatible. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend that you get that book. Okay. It's a great book, the best book on AI. And he, in his book, he says there are, he has identified 200 separate efforts to, to uh, list AI ethics principles. And I mean, think about automobile safety. So go back to when Ralph Nader was testifying in Congress and all this stuff. And, and with that came a lot of laws regulating automobiles. Well, imagine instead of all that, the, the, the auto companies had just gotten together and enumerated a set of safety principles, you know, and yeah, said, no, yeah. hey, we're, we're great. That solves the problem. We got safety principles. Every, I mean, it, it doesn't cut it. So uh, I believe that a lot of these AI ethics efforts are really uh, an effort to avoid facing the really difficult issue of op trans openness, especially openness, but regulation in general. I guess if the number one facet of those codes is what you say is transparency, then everything yeah. leads they, from there, but, right? But they don't. I mean, if you read those principles, they do not say total transparency. That's what they don't say. And in okay. fact, there was a, a great article uh, uh, in uh, December of 2019, so that's less than a year ago, about the big pushback at Google against transparency. I mean, Google, you know, Sergey Brin and Larry Page had started their company off with the idea of being very transparent, especially among their employees. And it was this article in the Yahoo financial section, uh, I think it was Yahoo, uh, about the pushback against transparency. And these companies don't want to be transparent. You know, they don't want it because they're, they're in business. They're in business to make money. And if you give all your trade secrets away, that's not good for business. So, and, and my point is, you know, these guys could be completely transparent and they would still make billions of dollars, you know? Yeah. And, you know, one thing about transparency is it would enable them to enforce their patent and copyright, you know, because they, they would know what their competitors, if a competitor stole their algorithms or something, they would know it, you know? So you're not advocating open source necessarily. You're advocating mm. a transparency which would, yeah. which, which, which would protect them. I mean, that's one of the things yeah. that you're at. That, I, that's I, think, I think open source. I think I'm, I'm gung-ho for transparency and accountability. I mean, what, what I said in that little, uh, I wrote this thing in May, you know, about accountability and transparency where, uh, all inputs, not only the algorithms of information processing systems, but all the inputs have to be transparent to anyone who's in the range of effect of these inputs. I mean, it's a really radical idea. It's completely a radical change in the way that corp corporations are governed. And so it doesn't have a snowball's chance of happening, you know, but- Well, not necessarily. I mean, look, we've seen all sorts of, I don't know, what. Um, the jolting technologies that then give rise to new ways of doing things. And it, look, I, I, there are so many interesting things that are going on that, that I, again, I'm, I, I, because I made this film, I, I look at things through the lens of FM 2030 and like some of the optimistic statements he, yeah. he made and yeah. then look at some of the things that are happening and then also see what's 
opposing it. And so, I, I, I don't know, I mean, stranger things have happened, certainly today. It doesn't seem that likely because it, it, on some level, it seems like a lot of the promises of both technology and the what sorts of work that you and others are doing are then stifled either because of inertia and bureaucracy or because in some ways of marketing because it's not positioned in a particular way. Uh, I think transparency and accountability uh, are face resistance from people that simply don't want it. They understand it very well. You know, it's, they just don't want it because, it, and it could, it could be inertia in a sense that this is, this is the way businesses run. This is yeah, how businesses funny. work. We, we keep secrets. We use them to make money, you know, and, you know, we don't want to open up. But uh, I feel that the, I think that the, the, the level of uh, danger from artificial intelligence is so great that it needs a radical different approach. It's not like other technologies because other technologies, uh, also this way, AI, the human brain is a source of science and technology. And if we build machines that improve on the human brain, then uh, it's a radically different kind of proposition. And, uh, you know, humans, there's a real prospect of humans becoming very much second class citizens in our world. Um, you know, and, and there's history provides lots and lots of examples of when a group of people becomes unnecessary, serves no purpose, no useful purpose to the wealthy and powerful, when a group of people perhaps is even a liability, seen as a liability by the wealthy and powerful, that group of people don't do so well. <laughs> but you know, the, the, we're in, you're, you're imbibing some human characteristics on these AIs. Now, now in some ways they're modeled on these things as you described, right. but there are certain characteristics that to me are much more sort of evolutionary emotive characteristics mm -hmm. that in theory, AIs will not learn because they don't have those same mm -hmm. motives, right? Even yeah. if they are modeling them on this environment, I mean, the, the idea of wealth even, or yeah. greed, or, or even, oh, the, these, these little, who are these people? They're not useful. Even this idea of utility in the way we think of utility rather than efficiency as probably a computer model will think about those things. Those are different, right? Uh, yes. Well, you know, there's two ways to think about the danger of AI. An awful lot of people who talk about the danger of AI, for them, the danger is that human beings will lose control of AI and that AI will work, will act independently. That's not the danger that I see. I see the danger that humans remain in control of AI. And the question is, which humans? <laughs> Now that I see, look, this is Brave New World. I mean, this is Huxley, right? I yeah. mean, and look, and there's aspects of it that we're seeing already. So if, you know, if the number one goal, if you think this, this sort of, this, the solution is accountability and transparency, and yet we also know that whether it's inertia or whether it's business as usual, they don't have an incentive. Um, the incentive is obviously the promise. That, that you talked about, which is efficiency and getting together and, and so on. So what, and I know this, this sort of goes beyond your, your um, mathematic, mathematic ability, though, you know, math, mathematicians, weren't they considered magicians at, at a certain point in our, in our, in our history? Well, so perhaps. Well, you know, I, the reason I'm so focused on this transparency issue is because it doesn't really require me to have uh, my mathematical skills intact. My mathematical skills are going away. So I've stopped writing those technical papers, but I'm addressing what I see as, as a serious issue and which is the need for transparency and accountability, which is really more of just a public policy kind of thing. It's not really a math kind of thing. Are there, I mean, you seem very, you do seem worried. You seem kind of a chill person, but you seem actually a bit worried about this. Are there particular things that have, things that have happened in the, as we are getting more adept at creating these AIs that, that have given you more worry rather than less? Yes. Okay. 
So we can see what's happening in China. They're just gung ho to use AI to surveil and control their population. And they make, they're not even hiding it because I mean, it's, it's consistent with their ideology. You know, the communist party runs things. The people don't have freedom of speech. They don't vote. I mean, it's the idea, the idea of using AI to surveil and control is very consistent with their ideology. We also see it in the US, you know, Obama was extremely innovative in 2008 in his use of the internet for politics. And then Trump was extremely innovative, went beyond what Obama had done. Trump was extremely innovative in 2016 in his use of the internet for politics. And uh, we see um, the, the corporate, we see this, this thing where Google is resisting being transparent. Uh, you know, we see what was going on with, with Facebook and, and politics, you know, and, and so, I mean, politics and AI is a, is a marriage, a marriage made in heaven or probably a marriage made in hell, you know, and, uh, you know, it's just, it's just this thing. If everyone thought the way I did, the world would be a better place. And look, here's this tool that I can use to make sure everyone thinks the way I do. So, so in order to, I'm, I'm trying to think of, of in our history, how we've gone from opaque opacity to transparency mm -hmm. almost organically. And I, I can't yeah. think of too many, um, too many instances. I mean, are there, in, I mean, cause that to me, if I'm taking you seriously, which I am, mm -hmm. like these are real dangers and the, and the wheels are off the bus. I mean, these things are happening. So either we yeah. get a handle on it or, we, or yeah. we're screwed. Right, so, right. Or at least there is some degree of being screwed. Right. So I think the best hope is journalism. For journalists to, and we see story, we constantly see stories. And the interesting thing is, uh, suspicion about AI is not a left versus right issue. So our politics are very emotional right now on a left versus right thing. But the suspicions of AI are not a left versus right thing. So there was a great article in The Guardian, um, I don't know, a little more than a year ago, I think, about how uh, so much of the media is just, is just regurgitating the press releases from the big internet companies and uh, how they need to really dig in and how there needs to be uh, regulation. So the Guardian is gung-ho for getting to the bottom of what's going on with AI, but also Breitbart. Breitbart <laughs> hates the tech industry. They call them the masters of the universe. So both the left and the right are very suspicious of what's going on with the AI industry. So it's not really a left versus right issue. It's more like uh, the, the people on the fringes sort of depend on uh, the, the, the internet to get their message out. I mean, if we think about before the internet, if, before the internet, if you had something you wanted to say, you had to go through various gatekeepers. You had to go through the editors at the New York Times or the editors at NBC, CBS, ABC, some, you know, you had to go through these and they sort of could control what got disseminated. And then along came the internet and now any Looney Tune can get his ideas out there. So we have QAnon and all this other craziness, you know, people are free to put all kinds of crazy ideas out there, but it is a kind of freedom of, of speech that didn't exist. And uh, so uh, the people on the fringes are tending to, to be suspicious of the central control of information. You know, to me, freedom of speech is sort of the other side of the coin with transparency and accountability. It's all about freedom of information. So, an openness of information. With totalitarian regimes, and we've seen this in both science fiction, but in history, it is, you know, it is the control of that information which is used to push a particular populace in a certain way in, certain, in, in human history, terrible ways, exterminations of, of yes. people and so on. So here we are with these tools, both available to these institutions, these companies, but also, very, uh, you know, in some ways, you know, as, the, as certain of these algorithms become easier for some coder in their basement or at home, 
to also have them. I mean, there, there's a democracy around this in some ways, right? Mm -hmm. As this, as, so how does that sort of affect your thoughts around that, you know, where the individual can have their own AIs that they can unleash to try and get my point of view, but they're yeah. competing with the, the state. Does that, is that, is that in the mix at all? Because obviously, if you look at, I was thinking about your, your model of like trying to get something attended to, and I don't know what the equivalent is, but in England there was Speaker's Corner. People could come and yeah. shout their, their things and either people would throw eggs at them or, or in more contemporaneous societies, people would say, oh, there's another lunatic talking about <laughs> whatever. We had, so that was the people with their ability to go into the town square and shout. Now, as you say, but now, you know, soon come, we'll have our own AIs out there, which the individual can control. Does that, is that, is that a factor or? Yeah, I mean, uh, right. I mean, you may get groups of people. One of the things is to, uh, one of the critical skills for AI is the ability to talk to a billion people. And, you know, I can build an AI, but I'm not necessarily going to be, it's not necessarily going to be talking to a billion people. You know, I have to get a big market. I have to have the computing resources to be able to do that. And then I have to be able to promote it. You know, every internet startup hopes it will have a billion users, you know, but a lot of them don't make it. And of course, one of the things that happens is that if they, if they look like they're going to make it, then Facebook or Google just buys them, you know. Yeah. So, so, so as we aspire, as, as, aspire to this, I mean, this sounds more, as I said, more and more like Brave New World and we've got Elon Musk. Well, what do you think of the Neuralink demo? Did you see that last week? What, what's your impression of inserting other ways that we can, we yeah. can... Um... Well, I'm a huge fan of uh, Elon Musk. You know, he co-founded a company called OpenAI, which is the idea is to be transparent in what they're doing. And he's also a, a great advocate for openness in technology. You know, he says, we're gonna take all the stuff that Tesla's doing and make it open to anybody that, you know, we're not gonna keep our technology secret. So he's a great promoter of openness. So I'm a, I'm a big, big fan of Elon Musk. Uh, Neuralink in specific, I mean, yeah, it's absolutely something that's gonna happen. I didn't, I didn't actually see the demo. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have had very high expectations for what the demo would do at this point, you know. Uh, but in the long run, you know, one of the things about human brains is uh, there were some experiments with ferrets uh, where they, they did some surgery on ferrets that would be totally unethical on people and they rerouted the optic nerve into where the the input from the ear comes into their ferret's brains or something like that. And what happened was the ferret's brain, the ear circuits gradually learned how to be eye circuits. Wow. You know? And so circuits are adaptable. So the brain circuits are adaptable and uh, artificial uh, circuits are adaptable. The whole thing about deep learning and all that is that they're adaptable. So if you connect up a bunch of human brain cells with a bunch of artificial brain cells, they'll learn how to talk to each other. You know, they, they, both of them will adapt to it. And if they have, especially if there's some purpose, if there's some goal that they're trying to accomplish together, they'll learn how to do that. This is, it's, it sounds both magical, amazing, full of incredible promise and potential. Yeah, your, your, um, your, you've made me worried because it's one thing for the AI to be unleashed into the world of the internet and in the world of phones and we can see transactions. It's quite another thing to unleash both a device that has AI components into one's brain. So, I mean, I'm both thrilled, but also immensely worried at, you know, whether it's Elon Musk and look, he's, if nothing else, and I like, I, I like certainly a lot of the aspirations and some of the things that he's done, but he's definitely fickle. Do we want a fickle controller of AI wandering around in, in, in billions of brains as well? Again, I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm not trying to be contrarian, but I'm curious as, to, as well, to how you jive those positions. I, I would say that Elon Musk is fickle in the sense that he learns. So if he tries to do something that doesn't work out, 
he stops or he changes it or does something different, you know. Uh, so far, I mean, I don't know of any, well, people do have actually a, a appli artificial appliances in their brains to correct certain kinds of neurological order disorders. And uh, so I suppose there's, it's, it's possible for people to hook up to something like Neuralink. There's probably some ethical issues at the current time, but eventually people will be doing it. But hopefully it'll be voluntary, you know. Brain yeah, and hopefully. There, and was hopefully a, there was a suggestion uh, about a year or two ago from someone who was worried about terrorism and wanted to have chips implanted in every person. A terrible, terrible idea. But on the other hand, you know, uh, even if even if the um, machine, even if the internet, the connect, the electronics doesn't connect directly to our brain, just by observing us constantly, they're going to get a pretty good model of us. There was a wonderful op-ed in the New York Times by um, a, guy, a, a novelist named Hari Kunzru. I read his op-ed and I thought, gosh, I wish I had written that uh, about yeah. how. When, the title was when our thoughts are not our own and about how invasive e even without being uh, having a hardwire connection to our brains how ai is going to know what's going on with us understand our brains be able to make models of our brains another thing ai is going to be able was to he do excited was was he excited about it or no, was he, he thought it was a great danger i mean yeah. and you personally you both you're both excited by it but also worried i mean you well, have I'm, that yeah. Well, I mean, I'm I'm excited in the sense that it's going to be a big change, but uh, on a social level, I'm worried about it, very worried about it. And and not only one thing he didn't talk about that's also coming is not only the ability to model individual human brains, but the ability to model human social processes. So especially peer pressure, we humans, especially young humans, are horribly susceptible to peer pressure. And uh, and and. AI is going to understand how to create very strong peer pressure. And, but, I mean, and also how to, how to, if they understand how to create it, they also know, understand how to, to dis, um, disempower it. I mean, again, I'm, I feel like we're, supposed to, we're skirting on both sides. But I mean, that's true too, right? I mean, if yeah. we understand how it takes place, we can also stop it. Because obviously, on the whole, I mean, one, it's like anything. I can think of positive aspects of peer pressure oh one should vote for example or but and i can think of terribly negative ones too so it's um and this isn't just because i want everybody to think like johnny even though <laughs> i do <laughs> uh yeah right uh, that's right there's all kinds of terrible things that happen from i mean you see these teenagers committing suicide and all this stuff you know so and and but as a mechanism for social control it's not only AI being able to model individuals, but AI being able to model social processes to create peer pressure, to get everyone to step in line, you know, everyone get, get with the program and do what the AI is telling us to do, you know? And so, um, it, you know, that's, that's, that's part of it, you know, and I, I think it's inevitable that AI and the internet are gonna be persuasive. I mean, you know, all of our media to date are all oriented around persuasion and this isn't going to be no different. So, but at least the persuasion should be based on open information, you know, on openness. One of the things I think you, you said, which I thought was interesting and I bet is very controversial. I think you were in one of the baby was this idea of no, no, no anonymity, yeah. no hiding behind, behind right. nom de guerres and, sure. and to tell me, I mean, that is a very, con I mean, it is this, and I think it, I think this is more American, but maybe not, but this privacy aspect, well, tell me, tell me about, tell me about the flack that you caught for, for saying that well. and also <laughs> how, where it came, where it came from. I wish I was catching flack. I'm just being ignored, you know. I mean, this, this this thing I wrote, I I I tried to place it in a few in a few things where I'd get a little more visibility and was unsuccessful, you know. So I just put it out there on my own web server, you know. So um, yeah, and that that is true. And anonymity, you know, people really like to be able to do things anonymously uh, on the internet, and you know. 
it's probably not so harmful for just a, a, an individual without much power to just be able to go on and you know say I hate so and so and do it anonymously or something like that. But um, you know when you get into very people who are very powerful and it's not just that they should be public about who they are, but they need to be public about what they say if what they say is affecting me. So what if, if what they say is having a real effect on me, then I want to know what they said and who they are. And, uh, you know, privacy to me is, so for instance, you and I have a conversation and I understand that you're recording it and hopefully it'll show up in some sort of uh, documentary you create. And so I'm not concerned about privacy of this, but imagine you and I were just friends and we were just having a private Zoom, you know, so it's just you and I. So in that case, privacy means no one else sees it. You know, we, we can assume we can go, I go into some conversations, I assume no one else sees it, in which case no one else needs to know who, what I said, because it, it, they don't, they don't get affected by it. It's just a private conversation between you and me. So for me, privacy is sort of linked to the scope of effect. If what I say affects the whole world, then the whole world should know what I said and who I am. So it, 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 it's about reach. In, yeah. in some ways, yes. so that reach and influence. So, so the anonymity aspect, look, I mean, how can you, everything that you say it would, it makes complete logical sense. I mean, you can't really have accountability without knowing who I am and people knowing who I am in order for me to be held to account. So the ideas of if, if you really build off these built these um, pillars of, of transparency and accountability, everything goes from there. And in some ways, this sort of, I mean, it does remind me of um, uh, the open, an open, the open society, at least mm -hmm. aspirations, this mm -hmm. idea of a truly open society. And now I'm sort of going back to what you said that we'll never really achieve that. It was very like, oh yeah, we, we want this, this should be the aspiration, but I don't think we'll ever get it. I mean, that's oh. what you said. I don't want to misquote you, right? Right. So in my piece, right at the end of my piece, I say, let's keep in mind that transparency and accountability I'm advocating apply only to information processing equipment and that the best things in life have nothing to do with information processing equipment. <laughs> so if you don't like the rules of transparency and accountability, then live your life away from information processing equipment. You know, <laughs> people this is very... Face. And, you know, just live a, a, a natural life, you know, to the extent you can. And, you know, and, and, uh, and you know, it's, it's only in the information processing equipment realm, only in the automated information processing with the great danger it poses because the equipment itself will become intelligent. Because the equipment itself will become intelligent, it poses a great danger. And so special rules apply in that domain. But in the rest of the world, you know, you know we don't need, we can, we just keep on going the way we keep going with all kinds of secrets and all that stuff, you know. All our, all our secrets and, and, dark, and darkness. I, I, <laughs> I, my, my, my last sort of very general question that you can, you can, there's, as I understand it from some of the books that I've read and some of the mathematicians that I, I've read, there's a real elegance and beauty in, in math. Oh, yeah. That, that, that gives an order to the universe or some sort of order to the universe. And the thing that I personally, as, as someone <laughs> um, who's getting older, is that I long for that sort of elegance because what I see in the real world is, is, non is, is um, chaos and, um, and violence and right. fear and all the rest of it. So. Yeah. Tell me about the, 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 the illusion that math gives us, that, that there is predictability or at least elegance or beauty in the universe. This okay, is your chance so, to rap poetic about math. So I talked about doing all the, I've written papers at the AGI conferences, the Artificial General Intelligence Conferences. Well, Artificial General Intelligence really started with a guy named Marcus Hooter. And before him, a guy named Ray Solomonoff. Ray Solomonoff, by the way, was a beatnik mathematician who lived in Greenwich Village in the 1960s and wrote some papers that were far ahead of his time. 
So in the early 2000s, Marcus Hooter, who's now at the Australian National University and at DeepMind, he works for DeepMind, which is the, the world's best AI developers in London. So Marcus Hooter came up with this theory, a mathematical theory called universal artificial intelligence. And the idea is if you want to have general intelligence, so my Othello playing program or somebody's checkers playing program, they're not general, they can only do one thing. If you want to have generality the way we, the way human brains are general, well, the way to get generality is mathematical abstraction. So Marcus Hooter came up with a mathematical abstraction of intelligence. And it was a beautiful, elegant theory. You know, he built on what um, Solomonoff had done. This elegant theory, and that spawned a whole lot of work. So in, uh, in 2011, uh, the AGI conference was held at Google headquarters. And uh, a couple of guys named uh, Laurent Arceau and Mark Ring had a couple of papers there that took Hooter's ideas and applied them to analyze all the ways that AI motivation could go wrong or at least analyze some of the ways it could go wrong. And then in 2012, inspired by the papers of Orso and Ring, I wrote a couple of papers uh, proposing ways to make them so that they don't go wrong. And then uh, a couple of years ago, a student of Hooters at the Australian National University named Tom Everett had a PhD, uh, it's sort of taking all the literature, all the hundreds, probably thousands of papers about this mathematics and trying to summarize them. And it's a whole mathematical theory of the way AI can go wrong and, and how to fix it. And so Hooter and Everett and Arceau all work at DeepMind in their safety department. They have a, a whole department dedicated to AI safety, which is very reassuring that the world's best AI developers have a safety department. So, but it was, it's a, Hooter's original theory, universal AI, is a really elegant, beautiful theory of what is intelligence. And it, it inspired or so it inspired me, it inspired a lot of other people to write a whole lot of papers. You know, there's great inspiration from that. that that's, it's, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful theory. And is that what, if you had to sort of sum up the wonder of our human mind that came out of all of these papers, how mm -hmm. would you, what would you say? Well, they make, what I said before, how a, an agent, an intelligent agent, creates a model of the environment by interacting with the environment, and then chooses and uses that model to predict the outcomes from various actions and chooses the action. What those paper, what Hooter's paper does is, his book does is, is to make it mathematical, to take the generality that I just said and to make it mathematical. Oh, by the way, one of my, I wrote a paper, the title of my paper is Model-Based Utility Functions. And that paper is a mathemat mathematical version of the following observation. Most people don't become drug addicts because they see that if they become a drug addict, then all they will care about is the drug and that the things that they current care about, like their careers and their families, will waste away because they'll stop caring about them. And that's why most people don't become drug addicts. They predict that they will no longer care about the things that they currently care about. So what I did is I took that and turned it into mathematics and got a really nice paper out of it. So an awful lot of, <laughs> an awful lot of math stuff comes from taking some fairly simple idea and turning it into mathematics. And seeing if it works in yeah. mathematics. Right, right. This is wonderful. Thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun and very interesting. And, and Thanks, I, really appreciate, I really appreciate your time. And I hope things go well in Wisconsin. And if you ever get to New York, we should have a coffee, a tea or something. Oh, that'd sure. That'd be great. <laughs>